So we're very excited to have Alicia Dickinson here. Uh, she's a member of the National Academy of Exact and Natural Sciences and of the Na National Academy of Sciences of Argentina. She was the vice president of the International Mathematical Union, both an AMS fellow and a SIAM fellow. And she's a member of the SIAM Council and one of the three inaugural editors of our favorite journal, SIAGA. She received the 2015 TWAS Prize in Mathematics and more recently a 2021 L'Oreal UNESCO Award for Women in Science. So we're very excited again and take it away, Alicia, to give a talk on families of polynomials and the study of biochemical reaction networks. Thank you, Jose. Well, in fact, I have to apologize because my title has changed, but the talk is essentially the same talk I gave at MEGA this year. There are some small improvements here and there. So if you attended my MEGA lecture with a different title, you can just happily leave the, the room, the Zoom. Uh, OK, but I, I decided to stress the, the point of my lecture in the, in the title. OK, so I will. Uh, I need to talk about some background and definitions for a while. This is what I will do at the beginning. And then also in, in this part, section three, I will talk a little bit about two different uh, papers, or it's more than one paper, two different uh, tools that I've been using. And then I will end with other current and future computational approaches from other people, and then I will end. So the main point here is that, in fact, there are chemical reaction networks, but I am interested in biochemical reaction networks, which are chemical reaction networks that are used in uh, biochemistry. In general, they are defined by systems of ordinary differential equations with parameters which are, in general, unknown. The basical mathematical theory was developed by ke chemical engineers and also by some uh, Russian mathematicians and chemical engineers that I, unluckily, I didn't. Uh, side here. And then tools from real and complex algebraic geometry started being used by Karin Gatterman. She was a fantastic, very nice applied mathematician uh, from Germany, but she died very young. But many people just followed her path. In, she also had several, uh, lots of conversations with Van Stuhlfels, and this also originated many of the things that you are going to, to see in the community. So the standard assumption is mass action kinetics, which makes sense when there are enough molecules and all is well mixed. And in this case, I will show you again families of polynomial ordinary differential equations, which have a combinatorial structure that comes from the directed graph of the reactions. So up, sorry. Up. This is probably the smallest interesting example, is an example that occurs in um, a paper in immunology by Makifan in 95, and then was mathematically studied by Eduardo Sontag. And so here you have A, B, C, D. These are four chemical species. In fact, they are, in this case, they are molecules. They are, this is a T cell receptor. We've heard a lot about the T cells with the pandemic and COVID. And then he was trying to explain how is it that the, the, the T cells can uh, differentiate, differentiate between self versus uh, foreign antigens. And then he proposed um, a mechanism that is a little bit bigger. This is the smallest one. So this it binds with this other complex and then produces in a reversible way this other complex C. And then this, this cannot react by itself. It gets transformed into D and then D takes part in other in a change of reaction. This, this is called the activated form of C. So here in the, we have a directed graph with four arrows. In the nodes, we have sums of integer, non-negative -inter, non integer combinations of the species. In this case, we just have monomolecular ones of this A plus B. This means that a and B bind and they produce C in a reversible way. And then you see that there are these case, these case are positive real numbers. 
And it is assumed that the dynamics is of this form. So what we are interested in studying is the concentration of the different species as time, 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 um, time evolves. And then we have function, this function of the concentration of the four species over time. And here, what we have is for each of these arrows, we have a summand. And this is a vector, or this is the derivative uh, of all these four functions. And then we have for each, for instance, this starts with this is k1 times, here is the product of the concentration. This can be the assumption of mass action kinetics is that somehow the, the reaction is proportional to the product of the concentration because somehow the concentration is like the probability for the molecule to be there is like number of molecules per unit volume. So if you assume that they are independent, then the probability of, of both is the product of the probabilities. And then here, these reaction vectors is A plus B. We, uh, interpret this as the vector 1100. This we interpret as the vector 0010, and this is as the vector E4. So here, what we have is the difference between this vector minus this vector. And here, I'm sorry, I'm missing here this K23. I should have this minus this. I should have a one here that I forgot to correct. I'm sorry. And so this is the form. Sorry, this is, I have problems with my mouse. So it looks simple, but you see it is nonlinear because of these terms, okay? I'm sorry. And then it is easy to see in this example that you see that mathematically there's nothing that makes A different from B. So on the right-hand side, we need, we need to have the same expression. So we call F1 up to F4, the, what we get on the right-hand side, you see there are polynomials and you see that this plus this minus this is equal to zero. But in fact, we get two linearly independent equations between the f's. And I put these two, which have non-negative coefficients. So f1 plus f3 plus f4, and this is also equal to zero. And so if the sum of the derivative is zero, then the concentrations, if we move in a connected interval around zero, the concentrations, the sum of the concentrations need to be constant. So besides having this case, we have these total amounts or total concentrations that I have here. So the dynamics is constrained, in fact, to a 2D plane in four space. So we have a curve in four space, but it's contained in these 2D planes. And this T1 and T2 depend on the initial concept. So you can compute this for any T in particular, you can compute this evaluating at T equals zero. And, and this is the general shape. So in general, we have a we have a set of species and the variables are the concentration of the species. We have R, R reactions with, which give labeled edges. And in the nodes, we have these complexes which are either this linear combination of species or we can just may interpret them as the exponents of a monomial. These are the monomials that we are seeing there. So this is x to the 1100, right? And then we, the chemical reaction vector is this, is a finite directed, directed graph with all this information. And we see, as I uh, said, the concentration as functions of time. And then this is the general form of the kinetics. This is the vector of concentrations. This is for each arrow, for each reaction. We have a positive number, a monomial, and this is a, an integer vector. It's the difference between the, the values of the complexes. And this we call F1 up to F, whatever the number of variables are, I call, I'm calling them S. So we get polynomials with this combinatorial structure. And it is easy to, there might be other uh, linear relations, but linear relations among the vectors yj minus yi gives rise to linear conservation relations. And the total amounts, this t1, t2 that I had, are determined by the initial conditions. So if we look at these polynomials, one can ask which polynomials occur this way. Well, there are, they are quite general, not completely general. For instance, anything of this form has an important property, which is that the not 
positive orthons and the non-negative orthons are forward invariant for the dynamics, dynamics, which means that if I start at the point in a positive orthon, then for any time where the trajectory is defined, that it will lie in the positive, it cannot leave the positive orthon and it cannot leave the non-negative orthon. So we cannot have concentrations becoming negative. But also there are these the famous chaotic Lorentz equations, which are of this time, and many models in population dynamics, like the Sears model and the lotka volterra model, and many models that we saw during the pandemic are of this form. So the universe is pretty big. So we are not going to study this with full generality. I will concentrate in particular reaction networks that are used in a systems biology. And the general goal would be, okay, try to, to make sense of what the, the intuitions of the, of the biologists and what they observe and try to get a black box that from a reaction network gives uh, some properties without, uh, needed, without the, the need to go to a lab and do the experiments. But this is too ambitious, right? But this is the idea, the, the idea in the background. So, so the idea is, sorry, I have problem with my mouse. So what I will do is I will concentrate in biochemical reaction networks with mass action kinetics. There are more general kinetics and many things can be also transferred more in general, but I will not do that. And we have two sets of parameters. For me, the parameters will be on one side, the vector of kappa ij or kij, the, rate constants and the total amounts. This will be by parameters. As I said, they are, they are in general unknown or difficult to measure, the kappas. And in, a, in other disciplines, the standard methods is just exhaustive sampling, incredible sampling, okay? But instead of that, we are going to look at the most special families of polynomial with the k kappas and, and t varying, and we'll try to uh, get a qualitative um, properties that we can just read from the structure. And if you want to compute, there are many things that can be computed with standard software, but in general, even for the most interesting uh, and simple, for, sorry, for the most more simple, interesting biological networks, we have too many vari variables and too many parameters. And then we have many mathematical results and computational tools, but we need to do something else because they are not enough because we have too many variables, okay? So this is the most basic mechanism. It's called the michaelis menten mechanism. Michaelis was a, a German biochemist and Menten was a Canadian, uh, well, eventually a biochemist. She was a medical doctor in Canada, but she couldn't become a, PhD in Canada. At the, she studied at the beginning of the 20th century. So she went to Germany and eventually to the United States to get a PhD. And so they describe this mechanism. So here, these are the main features, main characters. We have these S0 and S1, which are called the substrates there. These are all, in this case, they are all proteins. So we have S0. And S1 is S0 with a phosphate group added. The phosphate is not modeled. And it's, um, it's, an, it's called an activate, as I said, an activated form because the S1 takes part in another chain of reactions and produces some bigger response of the cell in principle. And so it is assumed that here there is the S0 binds with the enzyme. The, the role of the enzyme is to produce that the actions are uh, done at a time compatible with life, so quicker. And so this, they bind, they produce an intermediate species or complex. This is just one species. This is a name because it's useful to remember that it, it comes from S0 uh, when it, it is binding with, it's, it's bound to, e, when it's bound to E. Sorry, my English is not working when I think better than, quicker than what I can uh, speak. And then this irreversibly, this produces S1 and E goes away. This is the, the role of enzyme. It catalyzes the reaction and then it goes away as, it, as at the beginning. And then there is another enzyme F, 
This is called uh, kinase and this is a phosphatase that produces also this intermediate um, complex or species. And then we get S0 back again. And uh, this seems to be a futile cycle. This is also the name, but it is not like that. The, this uh, Fisher and Krebs got the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine explained. This is a very good way to transmit energy in the cell. But so we have all these six species, six reaction rates, six reaction, but the way in, in which it, it is written is with this small cartoon. So this small cartoon means that we have all this information. And then this is, um, the, I'm going to tell you about the ERK pathway, which is com composed on small pieces of this form. So this is, this is a very important mechanism that regulates um, at, at the end of this cascade, I will show you, this ERK is produced and this ERK gets doubly phosphorylated. So we get, instead of one phosphate, we get twice this. There's a double sequential phosphorylation. And then this ERK activates uh, things in the cell. The cell can then produce, can die, can differentiate. You know, can survive, can do different things. And when there is some um, disease, this doesn't work the right way and your body's in trouble. And I've just seen a recent paper by these people that was posted in archive in uh, 1st of December. And you could, you could find there more uh, references about, they also study a version of this uh, ERK pathway and they studied model reductions and, uh, um, identifiability questions. So for me, this, this written in a more mathematical way, this is the membrane of the cell and then the reaction starts from the outside and then it triggers all this cascade in the inside. So it first is get this RAS is produced, this acts as an enzyme and produces that this gets phosphorylated this other molecule called RAF, but here, what is interesting is that the product, the substrate in this reaction becomes the enzyme in the next layer. And here again, the, the doubly phosphorylated um, substrate here becomes the enzyme here. And then we get this double, this PP arc that produces what I told you, this chain of important things in the cell, but it can also have some uh, retroactivity in this cascade. So this is the same thing, but maybe I just wrote it with more mathematical, a more mathematical way of writing it without the names. So in general, it is assumed sometimes that here the, the kinase here and here is the same one. So F2 is equal to F3. <clears throat> so in this case, there are either 21, we will assume that at least two of them are the same. So there are 21 or 22 variables plus 30, 30 six or, or 37 param parameters or parameters. I don't know how to say. Is it parameters or parameters? I believe it's good, I think. Anyway, well, okay, I will say parameters. I like it. <laughs> is this the English version? I don't know. Well, but the question is we have, if you add 22 plus 37 is 59. So how can we study the associated family of polynomial dynamical systems if we have almost 60 variables, okay? So we need to understand the structure to do this. So I need a definition of what is a steady state. So a steady state is a constant trajectory. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, the constant which, so a constant trajectory is a solution of this equation, which is constant. So if you are here, the derivative is zero, you don't move. So these correspond to the zeros of all the Fs on the right-hand side. So this steady states are the, I will be interested in the positive or maybe non-negative sol solutions of F1 up to Fs equals zero. So these are the positive solutions of an algebraic variety given by the Fs equal to zero. This is called the steady state variety. And what you see here, are what are called the stoichiometric compatibility classes. This is, for instance, in our example, this was x1 plus x3 plus x4 equals t1 and x2 plus x3 plus x4 equals t2. So these are the linear conservation relations. And as t varies, we have this varying family of linear spaces. This is called the stoichiometric subspace 
when it goes through the origin and we have all this family. And the, an important question is the following. So what I was trying to tell you is that if I start here, these, 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 these are invariant of the trajectory. If I start here, I might not converge, but I can only move constrained to this linear subspace, affine subspace intersected with a non-negative ortho. And if the trajectory converges, the limit is a steady state. Uh, the limit is a steady state. There could be steady states which are stable, which attract the nearby trajectories. Some ones which are unstable, which just repel, and, but they, this also drives the dynamics. There could be steady states in the boundary that I, I don't have them in this case. So, but we are going to try to understand the steady states. And if, and the question is the following. So here for this level of T, there is just one point of one possible steady state. So each tra trajectory here converges this is the only possible limit at same here for small values of t. But at this value of t, there are three possible steady states. In this case, we expect that two of them are going to be stable and one unstable. And here we have two, but this is degenerate because the intersection is not transversal. So non-degeneracy is that the, the rank of an appropriate uh, Jacobian is what is maximum. So, so a main a point, main question is if the chemical or the, if the chemical reaction network with fixed parameters, uh, no, with parameters case, sorry, has the capacity of multistationarity. If it is possible to find one choice of parameters, K star, I'm calling them, such that if we look at the associated system with these parameters, there is some T for which there is more than one positive steady state. But I will also interest in this was studied by many people. Our interest is also to find what we call regions of multi-stationarity. We are trying to find if, if, it is, if this is the case, we will try to find an open set in parameter space in kappa and T space. We'll try to find an open region such that for all kappa, for all parameters in this region, the system is uh, multi-stationary. And in fact, what's more important for applications also to understand multi-stability. So the, this is given by the signs of the, uh, of the negative um, part of the eigenvalues of a Jacobian. I'm not going to define multi-stability. Now I don't have time. So but multi stationarity is a crucial property because it is, as, as I told you, that you, depending on where you start, you could go to different possible steady states. So it is said that the, it allows the cell for different responses. It's not that it allows the cell for different responses because it means it's a deterministic system. But even if you keep the T fixed, depending on where you start, the ending points could be different. But the problem is that steady states are in general given implicitly. So there are many of the here in dynamical systems, you are given the steady state, you are given, everything is given to you. But here the steady states are given implicitly as zeros of F and will have many parameters. So the standard techniques, uh, which are, you, you see examples in the books of dynamics, dynamical system in dimension two are not useful for us. So for instance, we, st we study and we give explicit condition with cascades with N layers. This is just one Michael michaelis benten mechanism. And then here again, the substrate is the enzyme all the way down. And here the, the true number of variables is, remember in the first case, we had four, four X's, and, but they were, there was, the dynamics were constrained to a two plane. So the true number of variables is the the dimension in the space, the linear space where the, the reaction is taking place. The true number of variables in a way tends to infinity with n. Uh, here it should be, no, this is plural. And then the question is how can we find explicit open multi-stationarity multi regions in this, in this case for any n? And also uh, we, for the, as I told you, how can we do this with the, ERC network. So the question is that in all these systems that I showed you and many others that I didn't show you, but they are very popular in uh, system biology, they have a basic structure, the, the reactions, the di directed graph of reactions and the complexes that occur 
have a particular structure that we call a messy structure. This means modification of type enzyme substrate of swap uh, with intermediates, which essentially amounts to having a partition of the set of species, which is a partition which is natural for uh, biochemists, because we have the substrate, some enzymes, and that these species that have a different um, somehow behavior. And then what we can give is different combinatorial conditions that I am not spelling out that allow us to ensure if they are satisfied hmm, that there are no boundary steady states in the boundary. This means that trajectories need to be at a positive distance from the boundary. And this positive distance depends on, on, the, on the initial conditions. That the system is conservative. This means that this intersection with the non-negative order give us compact um, polyhedra. And so the trajectories take place on a compact set. And we give explicit equation for these linear conservation relations. And in many cases, not in all cases, but in many cases, the steady state variety is rational and there is an explicit parametrization. So this is very uh, a condition that is in general does not occur for general uh, algebraic varieties, but it does occur for this mechanism many frequently. And then in many cases, we can predict that the steady state variety can be cut out by explicit binomials and parametrized by uh, monomials, as you probably say, say, say uh, no. And in many cases, it, we can even show that it is linearly binomial. This means that the, you, we can, this means that the ideal of the positive zeros of the Fs can be described by binomials. But in many cases, these binomials can be just obtained by linear combinations with rational, with real coefficients. We don't need to use polynomial um, operations. So, so for instance, in the in this ERC pathway, so we, what we give is a is a bunch of starting from the original. Um, directed graph of reactions, we construct some other simple directed graphs that I am not going to explain to you how we get them. In the first one, we just get rid of these intermediate complexes and then we do all this and just we look at this, looking at this, yeah, we can see things quite, several things quite easily and looking at all these, we can prove theorems. Okay? So there are some combinatorial uh, hypotheses that hold, for instance, for the ERP pathway, which say that if we assume that there are no intermediates, if we just, instead of adding the intermediates, you remember, we just think that there is a direct reaction from S0 plus C to S1 plus C, so we delete all the intermediates, then we prove that the system is monostationary for any choice of K and T. Because the idea that people have in general is the following, is that let, let's try to start a simple network, a, a, a way of getting less variables is starting is starting uh, simple networks and then extrapolate uh, multi-station, ex extrapolate uh, properties that we see. So it has to be said that this extrapolation in general use implicit function theorem. So this means that you can extrapolate, but in general in small, tiny, and in general you cannot express where uh, you can extrapolate uh, uh, for which parameters you can do this. We try to make this explicit, but the idea is to study some smaller network and try to extrapolate. But also this is also uh, useful even for biochemists because in the, it was interesting that Michaelis and Menten and people at that time, they couldn't see in the lab the intermediate complexes. But they didn't have them in the, in the modeling, but then the, they couldn't match, the, the equations didn't match what they observed in the lab. So it was conjecture by the chemists that there, was, there were intermediate complexes without, before being able to measure them, or, right? Because the, this reaction takes place, it degrades very quickly. And so once they assumed that theoretically that was an intermediate complex, then they could mimic the dynamics with the model. So it's interesting to say, well, maybe I don't need to put all the intermediates. Maybe I, if I want, I want, I expect some behavior, I can put some here and there and try to 
then to extrapolate from there until I get what I want. So if we take all of them away, we get nothing, okay? So this was the question posed in this paper by Elisenda Pedu and uh, Amir Hossein Sade Gimanesh. They say where to add intermediates to the modeling to ensure the capacity for multistationality for what they call complete binomial networks. And this is one of those, this ERC network. And so we, and these all linearly binomial networks in general satisfy this condition. And then they ask, which are the minimal subsets of intermediates with this property? So that if we add these intermediates, we get multistationality. And then they call this uh, name I like, which is circuits of multistationality. So in a paper that was supposed to be posted long ago, but I, I need to end editing it, with uh, together with uh, Mercedes Perez Milian, uh, Magariz Jaroli, and a Brazilian colleague. We implemented in Maple their criterion, but we translated it into by an equivalent uh, formulation. Well, I mean, the, the criterion that they use, in fact, was based in, in a previous paper that we had long ago with a title which is appealing because it has the name toric steady states in the title so many people cite this paper <laughs> because we chose <laughs> we were able to choose the good title um, but we use an, an equivalent formulation uh, with based on degree theory but what is interesting for me is that we are allow us to give full answers in networks like the earth pathway with all those many variables and even in in networks with in, an infinite number of with n, but each each is one with unbounded number of uh, variables, but with particular shape. And this is, of course, is beyond the capabilities of a general approach using a good computer algebra system uh, in any way. Mm -hmm. And so, a second tool that we use, but essentially what we use is the structure. Okay, there are theoretical results, but also there is this uh, the, the struct the use the structure. So the, also there is the story of the generations, which is also very much used in uh, algebraic geometry. It's also very much used in, in real algebraic geometry by Vero and people understanding this um, the topology of uh, real algebraic curves. And there is a very nice paper by Frederic Bian, Paco Santos and Pierre-Jean Spandiawer published in this fantastic journal, Sayara which uses uh, regular subdivisions of the convex hull of the exponents to get a lower bound. And they use, uses combinatorial arguments. And this was used by Bernd to study not positive roots, but real roots of complete intersection. So the, 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 do, the black uh, dots that you see here are the exponents of the Fs. So we have, remember that we have x dot <coughs> equals f of x. We have these polynomials f, which were sparse polynomials, sorry. In fact, we are going to apply this to some transform polynomials from the original Fs. But anyway, so we are given a system with the exponents are these black dots and we have any lifting. Any lifting is for any point here with fix and height could be negative, but it is easier to draw, if you, to draw it if you put it upstairs. And then we take the lower hole, what we see upstairs and we project. If this is sufficiently fine, we're going to get a triangulation, but with not, otherwise it's just a subdivision. It's not a, it's called regular subdivision of regular triangulation. If it is, if you get just simplices anywhere, but not all points are marked for is here, the height is, is too high <laughs> and then it will not be marked. Uh, but then you, you could have more points inside and you will get a, um, subdivision, which is not a triangulation. We don't care about triangulations here. So let, I cannot give you definition, so let me give you an example. So this is my set of exponents, and this is my, these are the vectors of coefficients. This gives rise to these two polynomials. So this is polynomial coefficients one minus two, one, one minus one, and zero with these exponents, okay? For instance, let's look at the second one. This one is one x, y cube, and here, I have zero x y cube. This is why I don't see it. Okay. So having a system of two polynomials with this monomial structure is just the same information given A and the matrix. Okay. 
we can write this as C times the column vector of monomials equal to zero. So we see that there is immediately a necessary condition for the existence of a positive steady state is that C needs to admit a positive vector in its kernel. And so the, the product of the degrees is 12. So we know that there cannot be more than 12 isolated roots in P2. But we also have this BKK bound, so which is the integer volume of A, which in this case is twice the Euclidean volume. And in this case is eight. This is the convex hull of, of the exponents. This is volume eight. So we know that there cannot be more than eight solutions in C star uh, square. But in fact, in this example, there are um, two positive solutions. For this coefficient, there are just two positive solutions. So what we can do, the way of degenerating it, this is the following. So we, we choose any regular subdivision of this, of the convex hull of the exponents. And in this case, we get these five uh, simplices. I'm not coloring this one for one reason. Is we say that the simplex, in this case, the simplex delta one is positively decorated by the coefficient matrix C. If we just look at the part of C that corresponds to the exponents in delta one, which is just the, the first part, that this is one minus two, one minus two, one zero. So these are the coefficients corresponding to the monomials that you see here. And what should happen is that, in fact, the linear system, which is associated to this, has a positive solution. And a way of saying this is you, we skip the first uh, column and we compute the determinant, we get minus one. We skip the second, we compute the determinant, we get plus two. And we skip this and we get minus three. So this is alternating. This means this is a means that it satisfies the definition of decorating that C decorates the simplex. And it is easy to see that C can, no, my, my, no matrix can decorate the three simplices here because we need a compatibility as we go and we go around and we have a, an odd number. We cannot decorate the five of them, but we can, with this C, we can decorate four of them. And in fact, this, the, the result of says, the, the generative result says, these have two positive roots, but if we, scale the coefficients in a way that I will show you in a second, then we can, we can get at least four positive roots. How do we scale? Well, the standard way, the standard generations gives a curve of coefficients, which define a system with at least uh, four uh, positive solutions. And the way is the following, the standard way. We pick any fixed age height, which induces this subdivision. And then this is there existed T0, which is not explicit, it's implicit function theorem, <laughs> but there ex exists a positive T0, so that it's T is smaller. Then you scale the monomial X, the, the fourth monomial by T to the H4, the third monomial T to the H3, all the way, so first monomial T to the H1. So you scale the monomials using T to the height of this, um, H that induces the subdivision. And then in this, and for T sufficiently small, we are going to get four because we could decorate four simplices. In this case, we can take this choice and of H's and this choice of T. This one over uh, 12 works. But what we wanted to have is to have an open set of multistationality, not just a curve. And so what we proved is a result that doesn't look like a lot like being in the Journal of Algebra, but sorry, but it was published in the Journal of Algebra, even with this <laughs> analytic expression here. Um, that says if we have the exponents that they need not be integer, they could be real, and the coefficient matrix. So we have n exponents and, and in n variables, okay, they represent exponents in n variables. So we have a matrix which is. Uh, R times N, this gives us the system of polynomials with these coefficients of these exponents. And we assume that there is one regular subdivision in such a way that it contains P delta one, delta two, delta P simplices, which are positively decorated by C. Then instead of choosing one height vector, we take the cone of all height vectors, 
which define, induce a regular subdivision of A, which contains these P simplices. So we fix the simplices and we take the cone of all the height vectors such that the induced regular subdivision contains these P simplices and something else that we don't care about. And so here it is easy to see that this is um, described by linear inequality. So these are vectors. These are linear inequalities in the H being uh, greater than zero. And so the point is there is a complicated way of describing this set U, but essentially this set U is described by the following. We take gamma such that gamma raised to MH. Here are the linear equations that define here, but with gamma to the MRR is sufficiently small or big. That depends whether this could be small or big. But essentially we did degenerate because we are moving far away in coefficient space. Uh, we are moving to the some <laughs> infinity in some toric direction. So, but if we take any gamma in this open set, then if we scale the J's monomial, but gamma J, we get at least P non-degenerate positive solutions. Again, this is not completely explicit, but we get an open set. And we know in which direction we have to, to scale the coefficients in order to get that many positive solutions. And if we want to use it, even if it is completely algorithmic to decide, even if given P simplices, they are part of the same regular subdivision. Regular subdivision is crucial because this is what allows that there are some open sets where you can extend the solutions that come from each simplex, but you need that you can um, extend all of them together. And for this, you need a um, regularity. Even if this algorithm, we have very, very big um, networks and also in with dimensions that go to infinity. So we cannot, if we have one particular network, you can do study your network, but we wanted to have a general result. And we found a way out, which just says, if you, if we have two simplices, the union need not be convex, but the union is inside a circuit and a circuit has only two triangulations. Both of them are regular. And then we can extend it in any way. So if two simplices share a facet, then they are always part of a regular triangulation. So this means we, it, we can, if we find two simplices which share a facet and which are decorated by a matrix C, then we can ensure that there is at least two roots. And in fact, in many cases, this implies three uh, uh, positive solutions. Mm -hmm. If we scale in using gammas in our set U that I just showed you. Mm -hmm. we, have, we can do this, as I said, with an unbounded number of uh, phosphor relations, for instance. And, but there are many, we have to fight with them. We have non-generic coefficients. We don't have polynomials with generic coefficients. And we, we use the, paramet the explicit parametrization. So we trans transform, we get rational functions of the original rate constant. We have to see that we can rescale the original ones, et cetera. But we can do this using the, the structural results of a messy system. And then just let me mention some other current computational approaches. There are these methods using degree theory that I mentioned. This is the best paper to, to, to have the theory well done. Uh, there is some symbolic software, of course, this in uh, grammar basis and real things. And there are tropical tools to separate time scales and M uses also M SMT solvers with uh, these people. Then there are also Elisenda Feliuti, Mother Wolf, uh, Nidi, and uh, I don't know, I don't remember his name. You do, I don't remember his name. Uh, they use, um, eventually you, you need to understand the sign of a Jacobian, and this is a polynomial. You need to understand the sign, what happens in the positive order with the zero set and the complementary open sets. And they use this song that they're using optimization uh, to decide the non-negativity of polynomials. Of course, you can also approach with this with numerical algebraic geometry, but in this case, you need you have a particular system and you put all, all your efforts to study your particular system. And because I, I didn't speak about this, but somehow there is a discriminant 
last result, and essentially there is a hypersurface in parameter space, and in each open ch uh, chamber, chamber of the complement of this discriminant, the number of positive roots is the same. But this is a huge object, so are too many parameters, and usually the open set these chambers where the number of positive roots is big is very small, is tiny, and it's far away from any degeneration. So it's very hard to get a hold on them. But if you have a particular system, they use very interesting numerical algebra geometry tools. And also there are some uh, tools used in um, by the chemical reaction network uh, community, community in particular, George uh, Krashen or Krachun, I don't know how to pronounce it. He used uh, Euclidean embedded graphs. And I saw a paper they just posted with Cassian Pantea, but Yoshi and I don't remember the fourth author on what they call CST networks. They also study more general kinetics. They ask the least that you need to ask that uh, um, mass action kinetics satisfy to generalize the results. And I, I don't know if this will be used, but maybe future compu computational approaches that I've seen, this is using massive parallel computations in algebraic geometry, just to do grammar basis or compu uh, symbolic computations. And also saw this paper by Mike Stillman and collaborators using machine learning to improve the grammar basis computation. And also there's this uh, nice paper with um, work with, uh, this is John Howenstein, uh, Maggie Reagan, and these people that th this is a different um, mechanism, but they try, they, what they were able to do, to do using machine learning is describe the chambers in the complement of the discriminant, they could find that the maximum number here of positive roots, of roots or I get real roots, I'm not sure if positive is here with this six. But this is a beautiful picture that I love. And also something what I really like is this beautiful paper by uh, He, I don't know how to pronounce it again, Yang Wei He, or He, I don't know how to pronounce it, where he uses machine learning to, uh, to detect structure in, ma in mathematics, in group theory, in, in other areas of mathematics, to use machine learning to find conjectures in, and detect, detect structure in uh, mathematics beyond what we can see with our naked eyes. So the summary is that we can use algebra geometric and combinatorial tools to predict, predict some uh, dynamical behaviors in biochemical models from the structure without simulations and without knowing the precise reaction rate constants. In theory, we have several answers. In practice, they tend to be too complex to be understood or computed. And in fact, theoretical results are missing. We don't, there are no theoretical sharp results to get upper or lower bounds on the number of positive solutions of sparse polynomial systems. That is a, fantastic upper bound by Fabansky and then improved by uh, Frank Sotile and uh, Frederic Pian, but this very non-sharp, but we all only have shown sharp bounds for circuits. Uh, and a lower bounds, the only one that I know is essentially the one, the, the mechanism that I told you with the generations. And there are many open questions in particular about sharp bounds for the, as I said, the number and the stability of the steady state with the same total amount structure conditions to predict uh, or preclude oscillations, something I didn't mention in my talk. And answers of course, of course require combination of tools from these and also from computation, other computational tools that I tried to mention. And to end, I thank you very much. And I always end with this propaganda of this fantastic journal where you can send your best paper using algebra, algebraic, topological, or geometrical tools. And if you have a good paper, you can send it to the Revista de la Unión Matemática Argentina, which is completely open access, completely free for authors and readers. And we'll be happy to receive your contribution. Thank you very much. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much, Elisa, for the very nice talk. If people have questions, they can put them in the Q&A. We can read them off. Otherwise, we'll soon jump off into um, informal discussion time where the recording comes off and people can ask questions, catch up, or just chat in general. But yeah, um, so maybe while people type in questions or uh, one question I had was, 
uh, with the messy systems that uh, you talked about, uh, there's this uh, parameterization. Uh, how easy is it to actually recover the parameterization? Is it constructive, your methods? Or yes, is it different? yes, completely explicit. It is completely explicit. Uh, okay, there are some combinatorial conditions, but most of these popular networks satisfy this, and it's completely explicit. Awesome. Uh, so when, oh, so uh, oh, Team Lang let, let, said... me, let me answer something more. We started, so the first paper in this direction was proved by Jeremy Guanaguardina and uh, Thompson, I don't remember the name. That was shocking. Uh, and then there was uh, an interesting article by Elisenda Felion and Karsten Buf, and then there was an article by, two, three articles by Gilles Nakaja. But then, well, we started seeing that people were able to compute in many cases. Why are they able to compute? So we tried to abstract and to put the more general structure, which allowed people to compute. They, they did computations by hand, and we tried to generalize why they were able to, keep this, to, take, to produce these computations by hand. 